God doesn't want us just to survive. He wants us to go forward. And so no matter where we are in this pandemic, where, where it's touched us or hurt us or taken us through, it's actually helped some people, as you know, depending on what they do. The key is from this moment on, look to the Lord for direction, find the dream He has for your life and go forward with it. Build on the things you've learned. Look in the rearview mirror and collect some of those lessons. Don't stay there. Use those lessons to incorporate in your new vision and go on with God. Praise comes to you today from Southern Colorado. We are lovingly in the barn, okay? This technically is a barn. There were actually cattle and horses and all that and kind I'm of stuff. I'm bringing them back in as soon as this and program's over. <laughs> we are uh, moving forward from cattle uh, and horses to the barn and now today a studio <laughs> with Dr. David Jeremiah. We want to move forward. Yes. Okay. We don't want to go back. We don't want to look back at 2020. We don't want to look back at any of that. We want to go forward. How are you going to help us go forward today, Dr. Jeremiah? Well, I'm going to talk about some of the building blocks to go forward. Okay. There's actually 10 of them. We might not get to all of them, but we'll get to many of them. Okay. And uh, these are things that I've learned in my own life and discovered in talking with other people and hearing them tell their stories. These are the things that are necessary if you're going to get unstuck. Okay. And a lot of people right now are kind of stuck. So when you say stuck, uh, you know, let's, let's have break you that felt, down. Have you felt stuck this year at all? Well, I think there have been times when Don and I, you know, we just stay home and then yeah. we go to church if we do anything. Uh, I got to tell you a little secret of what we did. And it was, it was a good thing and a bad thing all at once. We had heard a rumor that there were so many restaurants in San Diego that if you went to a different one every day, you couldn't go to all of them in one year. So we decided to try. Oh, how fun is that? So we, I came home every day at lunchtime and we went to a different restaurant and we visited so many restaurants. Most of them we had to sit outside. And, yeah. But it, it was just, Donna would say, like, and I felt the same way. We're going to do this. She says, I don't care what we do. Let's just go somewhere. My goodness. We couldn't find, you know, where do you go on a vacation? We went to Coeur d'Alene. We heard that was a great place. Never been there before in our lives. And we didn't really care where we went. We just wanted to go somewhere because yeah. after a while, when you, get, when you don't go anywhere and you do the same thing day after day after day, yeah. it, plays on your, it plays on your psyche, it plays on your emotional well-being, and it's not good for you. Yeah. We've heard that the kind of the solution can't be worse than the problem. We've been hearing some of that. And uh, all I know is... From a biblical standpoint, there is a way forward. Yes, there is. Okay. Mm -hmm. So where do you want to start on this? We want to start breaking it down. We're going to be with you um, here in the barn <laughs> all, uh, all one hour and discovering God's presence and purpose in your tomorrow. Nobody in their right mind wants to go back. We want to go forward. Mm -hmm. Help us do that. Well, let me just tell you a little bit about how we got started with this project. You know, every, I write a new book every year, and I've been doing this for many years. People think I'm crazy. <laughs> Sometimes I think I am too. But this year I had been thinking a lot about this theme of not getting stuck or not getting comfortable in your zone. A lot of people find a comfort zone, and they just they get there, and they just never move. They just vegetate for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. And I know in my heart that's not God's plan for us. God's plan is always for us to be moving forward. Mm -hmm. Well, I had been thinking about that. We had a guest musician by the name of Tommy Walker who came to sing for us. And at the end of his concert on a Sunday night, he sang a song and the song was called Forward. And the lyrics were kind of like an expression of what I'd been thinking about. And I turned to Donna and I said, that's the title of my new book. I'm going to write a book called Forward. And that's how it started. Beautiful. Wow. So when you wrote it, though, there was no such thing as COVID-19 that we had heard of. No. So you were writing something. When he started Let's writing say it. <laughs> almost prophetically. Let's say that it was, it was a message that you weren't informed at the time was going to be so important. People have been stuck, loss of jobs, all that kind of stuff. And so uh, let's help them. Well, Matt, let me just tell you that, to be honest, 
this whole thing is probably a lot more about me and what I was going through than it is any other project I've ever done. Because there's this mentality out there that when you get to a certain place in your life, you don't go forward anymore. Mm -hmm. You just stop mm -hmm. and you wait for life to catch up with you. Hmm. I knew that wasn't right. I knew that wasn't God's plan. I knew that God wanted me to go forward. Mm -hmm. And in the process, I realized how important it was for everyone to go forward. And so I started putting down on paper the steps that you take when you go forward. And the first was you have to have a dream. You have to have a vision. You have to have a purpose for, for your life. And that was the first chapter of the book. Unfold kind of the, just, uh, you know, almost preach it to us a little bit, you know, because we yeah. want to, we want to, we want to really uncover some of this stuff because if you're connecting this book so closely to what in essence you needed to hear for yourself, that's kind of super interesting to me. Well, you ask yourself this question when you're where I am, do you still have a dream? Or here's, here's another question. Are your dreams greater than your memories? Mm. You know, a lot of times uh -huh. people get to this place and they live on their memories and God wants us to keep dreaming and moving forward. Mm -hmm. And that's my spirit. That's how I want to be. I don't have any desire to sit and just reminisce. I don't think that's what God has for us. Mm -hmm. There's too much work to be done. There are too many people to be won. The gospel is still not in some places. There's all kinds of opportunities. So the dream, it doesn't have a shelf life. Got it. The dream doesn't have a date on it. This dream is good until you become 75 or 80. Yeah. And my dream was born many years ago to, to, to reach the world with the gospel through teaching on, on the radio and television and, and through writing. And that dream is still alive. And then I began to realize that without a dream, without a passion, uh, without a vision, the people perish. That, that's an in interesting verse because we often think about the people perish because the one who is leading them doesn't have a dream. Mm -hmm. But no, the people without the dream are the ones who perish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a dream, you're stuck. And I just wanted to make sure that I laid down this format for getting out of the status quo and back into moving forward for God. Did you find yourself slowing down? Was this something that, I mean, was this a... Uh, no. shaking, you know, no, you know, nothing had really changed so much in my life, Matt, except what people were telling me. Mm. I, if I've had anything, if, if one more person asked me, what is my legacy plan? <laughs> I'm going to scream. You know, I, it, I, I know that every, you need to have one. Everybody needs, I understand all of that. But sometimes I want to say, you know, God brought me here when this church needed me to be here. And when I'm gone, he'll bring somebody else here. I didn't come here uh, the whole thing is the, the mentality that people have today about getting older, especially in ministry, is that, that there's some sort of special point in time where you have to turn in your Bible. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, say, okay, that's it. I can't do this anymore. When it makes no sense because now you have the greatest sense of wisdom you've ever had. Right. You know everything that, you know, somebody asked me, how do you know what works? Because you know everything that doesn't work. Because you've tried, <laughs> tried everything. You've tried it all, you know? I'm sure there's a lot of that here at, yeah. at TBN. Sure. You know what works at TBN because you know what doesn't work. Yeah. And you've had enough time to let that marinate and work. And, and so you're not quick on the draw. You don't rush to judgment. You take the time to think about things. And yet you still make decisions and go forward. Yeah. One of the things I did um, in the ninth chapter of this book was I made a list of all the things God allowed me to do after I supposedly should have retired. Uh -huh. And it was amazing to me. Yeah. I mean, I went to, I went to uh, uh, India and preached to the largest group of people I've ever preached to in my life. I preached to 100,000 people in one day wow. at the Calvary Temple where Satish Kumar is the pastor. I did his son's um, ordination sermon. I never have seen anything like that in my life. We built a brand new building on our campus, a $30 million event center. We did three Christmas specials in New York City. Yeah. I wrote 14 more books. <laughs> All of this is stuff that happened yeah. after, after after the time when, let's, so everybody says 65, you should retire. 
I was 79 in the 14 years between when I should have retired and where I am right now, I had the most productive time I've ever had in all of my life. If I hadn't come to grips with this whole forward concept, none of that would have been true. Yeah. It would have all been unexperienced by me. Yeah, and I'm so thankful that God helped me understand it's not over till it's over. Right. Yeah. And God has a plan for our life all the way through to when he doesn't need us here. He'll take us home. He knows when to do that. Yeah. And so that's just kind of how this all started. <laughs> you talk about rooting your dreams uh, in history. What do you mean by that? Well, in that particular part of the chapter, Lori, I was talking about how David had a dream um, for the temple. Mm -hmm. And he realized he was living in this beautiful paneled house and, and the, the Ark of the Covenant was up in a ratted old tent and it, and it wasn't right. He wanted to build a house for God. And he started making plans for that. And uh, God came to him one day and said, no, you can't do that because hmm. you've been a man of war. This temple is going to get built, but your son will build it. And you know the story. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is there's the back matter of that story is incredible. He goes to this place to buy the ground for the building of the temple. And he meets this dude named uh, Jeruna. And he says, uh, I, I want to buy this property because I'm going to build a temple here. And he says, no, don't, don't buy it. Let me give it to you. And, uh, and he says, no, you can't do that. I won't let you give me something. I'm not going to do something for God that doesn't cost me anything. Right. Well, the interesting thing is that place, the, the threshing floor of Jeruna was, was a place where not only did the temple get built, it's very near to where the cross was mm -hmm. for the My crucifixion. Mm -hmm. And it goes all the way back in history. There's a long story of that place. Mm. It wasn't just any place, it was a place with history. Mm -hmm. And the point I was trying to make there in the book was this, whatever it is that God asks us to do, we don't just do it in a vacuum. We stand on the shoulders of the people who went before us. Yes. You're doing what you're doing today because your mom and dad blazed a trail for, for you in this industry and you were a part of it, but they're not here anymore, but you're standing on their shoulders and right. your vision now is not just yours. It's a, and all of us are like that. Yeah. All of us. We build our vision on the relationships of the past. And if we don't understand that, we lose out on God's direction and his in the symmetry of his leadership in our lives. That's why I was Yeah, talking I about love that. I love though you had pointed out the scriptures where where when David was dying, he was telling Solomon what to do. And he was saying, just do it. Because right. God's with you. Have courage right. and do it. You know, and there's, yeah, yeah it actually says do it. You know just what I thought about? Just do it. Yeah. What I Be thought strong about, and do it. You know, I love that. You know, you can say that when you've already raised all the money for the project. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I always thought, you know, why doesn't anybody ever do that for me? You know, <laughs> Solomon raised all the money. Yeah. Or David raised all the money for Solomon's project. Right. Then you can say, go do it. You got all the money, go do it. Yeah. And he did it. And of course, God honored it. Yeah, I love it. Did you write this for young people or for older people? I don't think I wrote it for any particular group Just because I think forward is a, is a time honored and timeless thing. Mm -hmm. Whether I've had young people read this and tell me it's motivated them to go forward. I've gotten letters from people that are older than I am telling me it's motivated them to go forward. That's what we, the, the mentality of a Christian is always forward. Yeah. Well, I think there's, there's several things. Um, these 10 points that you bring out, I think your demographic age is just gonna, you're gonna connect, you know, my age is gonna yeah. connect with this chapter, this chapter, this mm -hmm. chapter, and this chapter. There's, there's a chapter in there about risk. You know, mm -hmm. uh, and that that seems to be speaking to me he more than good. than some of the other chapters at mm -hmm. this point in life. So it feels like whatever you kind of need is is really what we're we're doing. But obviously what we're trying to accomplish here today in 2020 is to move people forward. Um, if you just tuned in. We're here in southern Colorado. We're in the barn and uh, David Jeremiah. Pastor, you're going to be with us all one hour. Okay, I, I'm, I'm kind of intrigued by how this has started so far because you've kind of connected this to yourself mm -hmm. uh, more than some people do and connect. This is a, this is a truth that, that you're 
living by mm. example. You have written 14 books. You've built three buildings. You've, He's you're, written 14 books since he was 65. That's what I meant, since, oh, since you were 65 yes. years old. And, and so you seem to have this kind of, you know, I, I, can, I can attest to that. Your ratings are higher uh, today than they've ever been, okay? Mm -hmm. So this idea that you are... Uh, your your vision and your your purpose doesn't have an expiration date on it. Seems to be maybe the theme that's that's coming out. Speak to that a little more. If somebody thinks uh, this year's been too devastating, this year's been too hard, this year has I'm too old, I'm too this, I'm too that, or I'm too the other thing. Uh, speak to that. Well, you know we're always going to be tested in this area. There's always the idea that if you, if you want to, you can go and relax and live an easier life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you do what I do and what I've done all my life, I, I would never be happy. And here's the thing I've noticed, Matt, and maybe you've noticed this too. I know a lot of guys who were really very productive, still making a big difference for God. And for some reason, at the 65, they walked away from it. Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you one of them that I know is happy. Wow. Because uh, in, in this book, I tell a story about Howard Hendricks, who said that uh, when somebody retires, they die between two and seven years after they retire. Not because they're wow. sick, but because they lose they their lose purpose their... for living. My wow. goodness. And the idea that there's a limitation on how long we serve is a man-made idea. It doesn't come from God. Mm -hmm. There's no evidence of this anywhere in the scripture. The people in the scripture serve God all the way through until their old age, and then they went to heaven. Mm -hmm. God left them here. And, and that's what I'm trying to communicate, that I think one of the greatest wasted uh, energy sources in the kingdom today are people who have bought into the early retirement and don't know what to do with their lives. My goodness. Mm -hmm. I have a story that I'd just like to briefly tell you about that. There's a guy in our church named Tom Heyer, I met him years ago. He was a school teacher at Helix High School. He, he was a godly man, and, and he, he loved teaching school. But one day God spoke to him and said, Tom, it's time for you to do something else. Hmm. He and his wife prayed about it. He retired. He, he didn't go back and teach. He'd been teaching 17 years. He came to Shadow Mountain, and he asked one of our pastors, what can I do? He started out teaching a Bible class, and then he was put in charge of our prison ministry. He's been in charge of our prison ministry now for 18 years. It's the largest church-related prison ministry in the world that I'm aware of. We have teams that go into all the prisons in San Diego County. Mm. We, we have 160 meetings a month. Wow. Uh, we have constant people coming to Christ, both from the prison and from the families, even from the guards and the wow. people. My goodness. Every Christmas we have a, what he calls uh, the, 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 the great Christmas mail-out. And he brings people together, volunteers from all over the city, and they mail cards to people who are incarcerated. Mm. Last year they mailed 15,000 cards wow. to people who are incarcerated. And here's the deal. That all started in his life after he retired. Wow. My goodness. He redeployed. He, he retired and then he redeployed. Right. He got out of what he was doing to keep a, a living and he began to do something that was strictly committed to the things of God. Wow. That's the mentality we yeah. should be developing. Lord, I've finished my career here, yeah. and now I'm going to take what I've learned and put it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to max it out for the kingdom. Yeah. And if we did that, can you imagine what that would yeah. look Beautiful. like? Unbelievable. Wow. So this broadcast tonight uh, is going to more than half of the prisons in the United States of America. Uh, and it is going in uh, via satellite, and we have been a part of a ministry here at TBN called Second Chance that has uh, put this signal and in Lasse, our Spanish channel and, and uh, the Hillsong channel and some of the other channels that we have into prisons. And Amen. it's a very important thing. We need to uh, talk about that yeah. later. Um, the, the, the book forward, what if somebody is saying, yeah, but okay, yeah, I want to I wanna have this mentality. Um, so far, you've done a good job, uh, Pastor. You've said, this is the mindset we should have. I've done more after 65 uh, than, than I ever thought possible. I've done, 
But what if somebody is saying, yeah, but, meaning, yeah, but you didn't lose a loved one to COVID this year. You didn't lose your job. You're still actively doing your job. It, there could be some yeah, buts going mm -hmm. on. Sure. Uh, how do you get them moving forward? Well, you know, everybody has to make a choice, obviously, and there are alternatives. Do you want to live where you are in the, in the mentality that you currently have of defeatism because of what's happened in the world? Do you want to go back to even a more morose uh, idea of what life is all about? Or do you want to take by faith what God tells you that if you will take the step forward into the future and be open to him, wholly, wholly devoted to his will, he will show you a life that's way better than anything you've ever had or could have in your current mentality. To me, it's a matter of choices. People get to make the choice. There's nobody going to tell you what to do. God isn't going to reach down and jerk you into the future. But what I'm trying to help people understand is this. The future is better than where you are, and I don't care where you are. Yeah. Okay. The future is better than that. God has a plan for your life that is beyond where you are and what you're doing. And if you will commit yourself to him and, uh, and trust him, in the risk chapter we talk about getting out of the safe zone and getting into the faith zone. Mm -hmm. If you'll make the transition between those two things and move forward, God will be there waiting for you to show you the new way. And that's where the joy is, and that's where the hope is, and that's where the, that's where the real life yeah. is. You know, I know sometimes we have taken those risks and stepped out in faith, and there have been times that it looked like it was just a big failure. <laughs> and, and I have actually sat and bawled saying, God, I thought that was, that, if that's not faith, then I'm not sure that I know what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, and I can look now back at those times that even you thought were failure that yeah. I thought was th that where do you go from here? Yeah, you know exactly what I'm talking well, about. Well, you know what, Lori, you're, you're like my wife. My wife, uh, when you're married to an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. <laughs> the words that you hear more often from your wife are like this. You're going to do what? <laughs> <laughs> Donna. <laughs> yeah, I've and then, heard that you know, one or two And then times. after, the, after you explain yeah. it to him, then you, here's what she would always say. You know, I'm not really sure I understand this, but if this is what you think God wants you to do, count yeah. me in. Yeah. And we've had situations like that, too. I mean, even coming to California from where we were in Fort Wayne, we started a church back there. And in 1981, we moved down here. It was the biggest challenge. And yet, isn't it interesting how when you look back at those decisions, that decision to follow God changed everything about our lives. Mm. I, I know, I know. And I can attest to that. Probably what he has said more to me is, I have an idea. So if you could just do not say no and don't say anything until I'm done talking. Mm -hmm. At least <laughs> yeah. let me finish just, explaining. Just let it. me yeah. finish right. explaining before you say right. no. You know, and, and, but those risks, you know, have been some of the most amazing hmm. Let me, uh, let me tell one thing that mm -hmm. she's alluding to. I said to her one time, we made a movie. It was called The Omega Code. I remember that. It wasn't very good, <laughs> <laughs> admittedly. It was a miracle. But it was movie. the best we could do at the time with the kind of budget we had at that time. Okay. And that was Look, his Look, I would have a, a lot rather had an Academy Award winning actor and director and all these people. We just didn't have the finances to be able to put that together and excellence is doing the best with what you have at the time okay so we made a movie it was called the omega code we're now 1999 and we're getting ready to put it into theaters well we had to sign a second mortgage on our house to get the amount of money to put into the movie to get the prints made to put it in theaters and so nobody else wanted to do that. Nobody else, uh, a part of the film. We didn't want to do that. Wanted, wanted to, you know, wanted the last to put, person was me. Yeah, wanted to put any more money into the movie because it just wasn't that good. I mean, God breathed on it, yes, blessed it. But, Thank you, Lord. But I said this when we were sitting on a Friday night, the movie's getting ready to come out. We don't know if people are buying tickets or not buying tickets at this time. And I, I said, you know, in one weird way, Han, this is a huge advantage because we've moved to Hollywood. We've tried to make a movie. Now we've finally made one. 
it's now finally coming out in the box office. Yeah, we mortgaged our kids and our dog and our house and, <laughs> and, and everything we could do to get money to buy prints to put it in theaters. So we were out on a limb. But I said, Hunt, being out on the limb sometimes is an advantage because we're either in the right or the wrong tree. Mm -hmm. In other words, we think God's called us to Hollywood. We're we gonna, think. We're going to know okay? it here in a few We're going to know it here mm -hmm. by about Monday morning, whether or not we're in the right or the wrong tree and whether or not we need a whole bunch of new friends yeah. because most of the people we had consulted with about our move to Hollywood and attempt to make a movie were behind us and said it was the right thing to do. Well, we're going to know Monday morning whether that was really the wrong move. And we're not, we're not just out on a limb. We're in the right or the wrong tree. Mm -hmm. And some people don't get to know that. No. You know people that think they can sing and they really aren't that good of a singer. You know, everyone mm -hmm. knows somebody that, that lives a whole part of their life wondering if this is the right thing. Well, we got to know by that weekend whether it was the right or the wrong thing to do. It was, by God's grace, the number one independent film of the year. It was really the first time an independent Christian film had ever made money in the distribution system in history of Hollywood. So it was really a unique experience, mm -hmm. but you talk about being out on a limb. And you never would have experienced that if you hadn't been willing to take the step into the unknown. Yeah, yeah well, we've only done that about a thousand times. <laughs> <laughs> but that one, that, wasn't even that one was a big public thing. 1,400 yeah, sure. newspaper articles got written about this little film that wasn't very good. Yeah. And it was something that got the, I think got that whole industry mm -hmm. started. This is back in 99. And now Christian movies come out with regularity. And, but they weren't at that time. This is, you know, late 90s. Mm -hmm. And so it feels like I understand what you're talking about. But let me just be real honest with you. That wasn't comfortable. No. It mm -hmm. was scary as heck. I had two little kids and for goodness sakes, it was it was not joking. We had our house on the line. Yeah. You know, and God came through and somebody bought a ticket and, and it's only as you live long enough to look back on it. Exactly. That you see it. When yeah. There's a story in that book about what happened in our church when we moved into our new worship center. We were concerned that we wouldn't be able to stay faithful to missions as we had, had in the past. And so we were in a business meeting and somebody stood up and said, hey, pastor, since we ask everybody to tithe to the church, why don't we tithe to missions from the church? I said, okay. And then somebody else said, if we ask people to tithe to the church, why don't we double tithe to missions? Now, what that meant was we were going to take 20% off the top of every offering and send it away from the church, and we were going to live on 80%. We were already having a hard enough time living on 100% at that point in right. time, and I had no idea what that was going to be like. When we started that way back in the early 90s, our missions budget was like $250,000 a year. This last year, it's over $4 million. Oh, my goodness. And in the time since we did that, which was a real step of faith to, to right now, we have given over $51 million to missions. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, when you take yeah. that step of faith, it, you, you just wonder, and every, every week it was wondering, are we going to be able to pay our bills? Yeah. Are we going to be able to do this? Little by little, God honors that. If you live long enough, if you're able to look back, you see Exceeded God was up to something, yeah. and you got to be a part of the yeah. adventure. And it's yeah. really pretty cool. Yeah. That uh, is, I think what you're communicating very uniquely in this particular interview on this subject is that you're, you're almost better at this. In other words, this book coming from you at your age now is better than if you would have written it 20 yeah. years ago. If I had written it 20 years ago, it would have been a lot of uh, pontificating, but not a lot of history. <laughs> there you go. This what, is history. What, what's your favorite chapter in that book? Two chapters. I love the chapter about get your mind right, believe. Yeah. And I love the finish chapter because that was really, that really helped me answer those people who kept saying all of these things about, well, when are you going to do this? Or are, when, who's you going to follow? Or are you, is he, every time I'd have a young preacher come to the church, is he, is he going to be your preacher when you're gone? 
No. Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen when I'm gone. So funny. <laughs> yeah. That bugged me. Everybody would st would ask us, what's going to happen to TV and after your parents are gone? Yeah. He's, oh. You know what? Here's what I here's, here's here's a real good answer to that for me. When I was ordained, my father preached the ordination service and he preached on Acts 13, 36. And here's what that says. And David served his generation mm -hmm. by the will of God. Mm -hmm. That's all we can yeah. ever do. I'm going to serve my generation by the will of God. You serve your generation by the will of God. And when God is ready for somebody else to do that, he will show us what to do and provide. But we, everybody gets so bent out of shape over that, that, um, you know, I, I can't get over it. So I, that's why I wanted to put this in writing, yeah. that we're responsible to finish what God has called us to do. Mm -hmm. and, and, and go beyond where, he, where people think we should go. Mm -hmm. um, let me see if I understood what you just said in one way. Are you basically saying, back off, youngsters? <laughs> no, I'm not really saying that. What I'm saying is... Kind of. You're kind of saying that, aren't you? Well, I mean, I, I'm not saying so much that as I am saying, you know, l l let's don't put people out to pasture before God yeah. is done with them. Yeah, you're saying back off. Yeah, you're doing... You're. <laughs> You are. He'll, he'll say it for you. You're reminding, you're reminding me of my, my dad, dad a little bit. My dad used that term out to pasture. And, you know, they were they got a little chippy about well, it. And in their, in their late 70s, they were saying, hang on, you know. And, and I think what you're saying is we have the wisdom and the experience to do things that is unexpected at, at, at this time in your and life. And we also know... You know, and when I first started, I used to get, I used to get kind of hooked on some things people would say or do. Now I can smell them coming a mile away. <laughs> you know, I, I, I know when someone's going to try to try to work you. Somebody's got some kind of scheme. They're going to, uh, you can tell. And you oh just say, gosh. look, man, you can try that on somebody else. But I've been around the block a few <laughs> times and I know it's coming and I know what you're up to. So don't, don't run that stuff by me anymore. I'm not doing that. I mean, isn't that true? Yes. Exactly. Now, now yeah. you are reminding me of yeah. my dad a he lot. Wrote, he, he wrote us letters oh talking about stuff like that. Don't you ever let people... You know, yeah, let me tell you something. The last six months of my dad's life were some of the most productive Sweet. times yep. that I remember. I remember more about the last six months of my dad's life than the last six years prior to yeah. that. Just the last six months. He had a very purposeful kind of impartation to mm -hmm. Lori, me, our, our two boys, Kaylin and Cody. And we were with him almost every day of the last six months of his life. And it was profound. Yeah. And it was meaningful. And it was Precious. powerful. Yeah. Well, that wasn't just true between you and your father. That was evident in his public persona, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've talked about that in yeah. the past. Yeah. That God had really shown him the power of what he had done in his life and the importance of getting ready and helping you guys get ready. What do you mean by diminishing your distractions? You know, there's a, when we start out in ministry, Lori, we have this idea that we can do all things. Mm -hmm. That we can, we can just, what everybody, I remember when I first started, if anybody asked me to do something, I thought it was God. Mm -hmm. If I was invited to go someplace, I thought it was God inviting me. And I realized later that that wasn't true, that God wasn't in all these requests. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I remember in that section of the book, I talk about coming to grips with your limitations. Mm -hmm. And even to the point where I use Jesus as an illustration, that though he was the divine son of God, Jesus was limited while he was on this earth by his own volition. The Bible, the Bible teaches that he voluntarily uh, refused to use his his attributes at their full at their full form, so he could identify with man. Hmm. While he was on this earth, his ministry was limited to to, to Israel. He didn't he never he never went to any of the big cities uh, of his time. He ministered in a little place the size of a postage stamp, not hmm. bigger than Vermont. He never left. And yet, in that particular place where Jesus was limited. He had an unlimited ministry, wow. ministering to his disciples. Mm -hmm. And out of that, of course, is what we now embrace is, is the Christian faith. The point is, nobody has unlimited um, 
boundaries to do whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. We have to deal with our, and we all have personal limitations. There's some things as you get older that you can't do. I mean, let's face it. Yeah. I, I, I still have, I always think about Caleb who, who said he was as strong at the age of 85 as he was when he was 40. I don't feel quite that way, but I, <laughs> you're, the question I ask people. One you're of the not great, 85 yet. Yeah, and here's the question is, how old would you be if you didn't know how old you were? Yeah. Oh, there you go. And, and Caleb didn't know he was 85. He thought he was 40. Yeah. And he lived his life that way. And that's the way we should live too. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you come to grip with your limitations, you realize, I have limitations. I'm not Superman. Can't do everything. And again, we're not called to do everything. Jesus yeah. said, I have finished the work, Father, that you have given me to do. I have not finished all the work there is to do. Mm -hmm. I've finished the work you have given me to do. Mm -hmm. So I think, and that helps us. Yeah. And when we come to grips with that, there's nothing wrong with that. It's the right thing to do. Yeah. So it's okay to say no. It's all right to say no. You a minute ago said that your favorite chapter or one of them was get your mind right. Yeah. So um, maybe there's some that need their mind right because of, pandemic situations or election results or whatever, you know, how, how do you get your mind right? Well, that whole chapter is about optimism. Okay. And it's a really important chapter because there's a lot of folks who are Christians who don't believe that you should even use that word in the vernacular of a Christian discussion. That, you know, that optimism, and they identify it with some false doctrine and other things, which we all know are, are not, not to be discussed. But what I try to do in this chapter is help people understand that a Christian among all of the people of the world should be the most positive person who ever, who ever walked here. Our sins are forgiven. Our future is guaranteed. Uh, the Savior is living within us. He's given us His Holy Spirit. We have the church. We have the Bible. We have everything we need. And, and, and that's, what, uh, that's what it says in the New Testament. We have everything we need for life and, and life godliness. And everything. Yeah. But many Christians aren't that way, and I actually t uh, talk about that in this book, that when I was growing up, I, I went to good churches, but m the churches I went to, I remember more about what they were against than what they were for. Mm. And I, I knew a lot about what we didn't believe, but I wasn't too sure what we did believe. Mm -hmm. It took me a while after gradu graduating from college and going to seminary to understand that God doesn't want that to be the image of the church, nor the image of Christians. Yeah. We, have, we have no reason to be pessimists. Hmm. I read a book maybe three or four times by, by a guy named Seligman. And uh, the book is titled Learned Optimism. It's not a Christian book. It's just a psychologist book. And in this book, he made this, com he made this really interesting uh, statement. He said, if you want to know whether you're an optimist or a pessimist, a little trouble will help you sort it out. <laughs> and his point was, when trouble comes, people who are optimists aren't blown away by the trouble. Hmm. They analyze it, they climb up on the trouble, and they go on to the next thing. Pessimists look at the trouble and they think it's all about them, it's permanent, and it's never going to change. Wow. He said, so if you don't know if you're a pessimist or an optimist, wait till the next trouble comes, because mm -hmm. a little trouble will help you sort it out. Mm -hmm. My goodness. And God doesn't want us to be pessimistic. Right. I told you uh, in an earlier conversation before we came on the air that one of the great positive statements in the Bible is Paul saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah. That sounds like somebody who's gotten his mind right. Yeah. He's thinking properly. He knows there's a lot of things that can come against you, but even those things, he lists them all and he mm -hmm. says, but I am more than a conqueror through mm -hmm. Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm a super conqueror. That's the spirit that God wants to live in all of our lives. That's the spirit I want to be known for. Yeah. I want to be known for that kind of a person. Mm -hmm. We all have troubles, but troubles come to help us sort out whether we are half glass full or mm -hmm. half glass empty people. And it's really interesting how that happens. Okay. There, I, I don't recall, it, as we're sitting here, where the scripture comes, let the weak say, I am strong. Mm -hmm. I'm quoting the Bible. Yes. I just don't remember yeah. exactly where it is. Yeah. I, it's, yeah, it's almost thinking of the song. How do, how do we balance that scripture? Because you can't, um, 
just be optimistic for optimistic no. sake, but you can't be uh, just a Bible preacher that doesn't recognize optimism in the Word. No. So help no. me with that. What things are pure? What so, things you know, are just? If I, should, if I could say it in the correct way, I would think we should say, don't be a pessimist and don't necessarily be an optimist. Be a realist. Be somebody who sees life as it really is. But then through the lens of the Scripture, see life as God tells you it is. Yeah. The lens of the Scripture is what gives you the positive way to see life. When you read the Word of God and you see the Word of God, um, you, you realize that even the darkest things in your life God uses for a purpose and to build you into a, a better person. Nothing is wasted in the economy of God, not even our difficult time, not even COVID-19. Right. God hasn't wasted that. He, right. We're going to learn as we look back. I've, I've heard a lot of people recently saying, make a list of everything you learned from COVID-19. And I've actually seen some lists. Some of it's not all that good, but some of it is pretty good. We have learned a lot. We have learned that you can do a lot of things in ways you never thought you could do them mm -hmm. when it's necessary. Mm -hmm. And you have learned how important it is to be in fellowship with God's people, yes. whether it's through the internet or most or best being together as people. Um, what I've learned in my church is the people there love Jesus so much, you tell them we're having church at midnight, they're going to show up. <laughs> I mean, that's really amazing to me. Yeah. We have church outdoors and we change the time in coordination with the sun because if it's too early, it's too hot. If it's too late, it's too dark. I just, I just say, this, I'm going to send you a note. This is when we're having church. You all show up. And they do yeah. because they want to be together. Yes. I realize the power of the community during COVID like I never have realized it before. And I think there's just many lessons like that that we learn. And we take those with us into the next part of our life. Yeah. The part I want to jump back on and, and get more comment on is, is this optimism that you have found in the get your mind right chapter of your book. And I asked you about let the weak say I'm strong. You can't just quote that like a mantra. How, how from, from your seminary background, how would that scripture have been taught and how would you have used the context well, of I would that? Say, I would say that scripture more is like, let those who, are, who think they are weak, take a look at who, who Jesus is in their life and realize how strong they are. Yeah. Okay. Because in our, in our weakness, sometimes we forget that. Uh, there are other ways to look at that, but that would be the way I would understand that. And I think, this, I think the scripture teaches us that when we are weak, then he is strong. What does that mean? I have preached sometimes, recently, I'll, I'll tell you something. I just, uh, I preached a, for a men's uh, thing back in, uh, in, in the Southwest just a few weeks ago. And you've probably done this. I went to that meeting and, and by the time I got there, I was so sick, I didn't know if I was even gonna be able to stand up. Mm. And I got some medicine, I got some antibiotics and I took them. And I got up and my friend who runs this is a guy named Phil, Phil Waldrop. There were 10,000 guys there or 8,000 or something. And it was an amazing thing I preached. I wasn't even quite aware of what I was doing. I almost felt like I was in the pulpit and somebody was preaching beside me. My goodness. I, was, I felt so bad in that. And, and I really, I had to leave right afterwards because they wanted to get us out of there. And I wanted to say to Phil Walter, please forgive me for coming here and not doing better than I did. I felt awful. I went home, I told my wife how bad I had done. The next week I got a letter from him an email and he said, David, I don't know what was going on, but he said, after you get on preaching, I had men come up who've heard you preach over these years many, many times and tell me that was the best sermon they ever heard My you goodness. preach in your life. Yeah. He said, what was going on? I said, Phil, I was on drugs. <laughs> <laughs> he said, what do you mean? I said, I had every kind of antibiotic and everything else I could put in my system. But what I realized again and again, and I've seen this over and over again, is sometimes when you feel like you have totally failed and you've given it your best, that's when God moves in. Yes. And in your weakness, yes. He is strong. Yeah. That's what I think that's all about. Yes. Isn't, isn't, that, isn't that what we're talking yes. about? I, Absolutely. Look, we're, we're, we're <laughs> wanting your information. I, I don't... I, I fully believe that. I certainly believe. But I like the fact that you've really drawn out 
this optimism thing because not very many people are optimistic. Well, I don't think like. you can be negative and move forward. You know what? That is a very important thing. I do not know very many pessimists who have made anything great out yeah. of their lives. Mm -hmm. Pessimism does not move you forward. Right. That is a very solid principle, right? And that's certainly, that's the whole nature of that chapter. Yeah, I love how you give the, the analogy of your windshield and then you have this little tiny rear view yeah, mirror. right. You know, that yeah. you look, just glance up at, but you can't focus on that. No. You know, and Paul, so I love, Joel Osteen was here last, the last couple of days and he was talking about Paul the Apostle didn't say this one thing I do. I pray that I'm a better writer or that I'm a better preacher or that he said better this leader. one thing I do is I forget those forget things mm -hmm. and I Which press forwards and you can't you can't reach back and press you know somebody said time. God put eyes in the front of your head not in the back of your head because <laughs> yeah. he wants you to see forward and the and the rear view mirror and the windshield is a really good issue yeah it's about the right ratio yeah the there windshield is made for you to look forward in your dreams and your visions mm -hmm. The rear view mirror is what you glance at periodically mm -hmm. to make sure you're okay. Mm -hmm. As I said once before, the past should inform you. It should not control you. Yeah, so good. Because if, it, if you let the past control you, it's the whole idea is, are your, are your dreams greater than your memories? Yeah. I want to make sure as I go forward in my life, however many years God gives me, I always want my dreams to be greater yes. than my memories. Yes. Beautiful. You know, I, I believe you can get stuck in failures in your past, and I believe you can get stuck in your successes of your past. You're absolutely right. And God wants to move you on to, to greater things. He's, he's always a God of more. He's mm -hmm. always a God of multiplication. Right. And so I think he wants to bring more into our, that, that, that eternal, everlasting life that just keeps give, keep us on giving. Um, but I think you can get stuck in successes. Too. You can. And, and it just holds you in a time and God wants you to let go of all that stuff. It's like, when, a, it's like when an actor or actress <laughs> plays a very iconic role and then they seem to have to dress like dress that, up for, the like that for the rest of their life. You see them 30 years later and they're the still dressed up like, that. you know, that, that character they did, you know, yeah, years right. ago. Yeah. Kind of sad. And, and they didn't move forward. Okay, we have a few minutes left in the broadcast, and, and why, don't we, why don't we try to encapsulate a little bit of, of, if somebody tuned in halfway through, what is your overarching message in this book, Forward? It seems like it was a, a, a message, a, a, a book that was prophetic in, in one sense, meaning you were writing most of it prior to knowing that COVID even existed, but it feels like it's the message for a lot of people mm -hmm. right here, right now. And that's why we're spending so much time on it. Mm -hmm. This is a, this is a important message for an important time for a lot of people that are having to start looking out the windshield and not continue glancing back. No one in their right mind wants to go back, but unfortunately, a lot of people are stuck mm -hmm. and we need to go forward. So just kind of the overarching again, if you had to kind of almost a new intro to the subject and then maybe your final thoughts in regard to that, maybe pray for the audience a little bit. When I was uh, president of our college years ago at, uh, in, in San Diego, I remember reading a book that was written by the president of Southern California University after he had retired. And he made a statement in that book. I went and wrote it on the blackboard one day in a meeting. And here's what the statement says. Never give to survival the attributes of success. In other words, a lot of people today think that success is just to survive, just to get through this. And you hear people say that all the time. What are you doing? I'm just trying to get through this. Well, that's good. You need to get through it. But you cannot give to survival. Survival is not success. Right. Survival is staying in the safe zone. I want people not to give to survival the attributes of success. I want them to go on. I want all of us to go on from where we are. I was with a, a pastor. If I mentioned his name, you would know him. He's a pastor of a big church. 
and they've been they have been back in church since May. And he said to me the other day, David, we only have less than 50% of our people back in church. He said, uh, uh, my, my mantra used to be, we need to go, go forward. Now he said, it's got to be, we need to grow. Wow. You know, even Barna said in one of his writings about COVID-19 that in major churches that have been successful in the evangelical church, 30% of the people who were in the church before COVID will never return. What does that say? They found a comfort place. They they found a place where no risk is. They found a place where they've taught themselves that they don't need to go to church. And so, we're facing some real challenges as we restart. We're trying to keep track of that. We're doing a little better than fifty percent, but not much better at this point in time, because families with little children won't come back yet, and older people are afraid to come back. So, what I'm saying is this: we can survive this, but we must not let our survival of this be the ultimate answer. God doesn't want us just to survive. He wants us to go forward. And so no matter where we are in this pandemic, where where it's touched us or hurt us or taken us through, it's actually helped some people, as you know, depending on what they do. The key is from this moment on, look to the Lord for direction, find the dream He has for your life, and go forward with it. Build on the things you've learned, Look in the rearview mirror and collect some of those lessons. Don't stay there. Use those lessons to incorporate in your new vision and go on with God. That's my prayer for myself and for my church, for Turning Point, for all that we do. We want to go into the the zone of trust and risk and and serve Lord. That's where the adventure is. That's getting up every day, and you don't know what God's going to do, but because you're walking holy with Him, you know He's up to something in your life, and it's going to be something you never dreamed beyond anything you could ever imagine. Pray that, pray that over our audience, if you would, please. Father, there's so many people who, who have just been so intimidated and frustrated and discouraged by what has happened to our country through this terrible pandemic. We don't pretend to understand it. We don't pretend to understand why it was allowed. But Lord, here we are. We're kind of in the middle of it, trying to come out of it and get our life back together. Help us not to ever settle on survival, but Lord, help us to realize you have created us for the future. Build into our hearts great dreams of great things accomplished in the future, both for the kingdom of God, for our families, for our own lives. Give us a vision, not of what has been done, but what you can do. Help us to focus on your power, not on our own strength. Help us to believe in your Holy Spirit, not in our initiative or energy. And most of all, Lord God, keep our eyes on the goal. Even as Paul prayed that he would um, forget those things which are behind and focus on those things which are before him and that he might move toward the calling of Christ in his life. This we pray for our listeners, our viewers. This we pray for those who've tuned in to this important telecast. This we pray, that we will not stay where we are, but by your grace, we will go forward. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know, um, I love the fact that your life is mirroring your own book and your own title. More people are tuning into your broadcast here on TBN than have ever tuned in. Uh, your broadcast is more popular than it's ever been. It's just uh, done it so it looks so beautiful. <laughs> so good. You've gone to another level. Uh, we appreciate everything that you've done. The programs that I'm seeing on the air now, when you have that big screen and everything, are just so beautiful and so well done, and you do it so well and so classy. Great job. You're living your own advice. When our and, boys uh, say, wow, that yeah. is a good looking show. You know, one of those one of those show. people that I think has <laughs> advantaged because of the pandemic is Amazon. Uh, <laughs> and by the way, you can get this book by uh, by going to Amazon. They'll have it. They'll get it to you real quick. Uh, and uh, we want you to get it. Yes. Uh, David so Jeremiah, uh, you're living forward. You're doing a great job. We, we love, love you. you. Thank yeah. you very much. We'll see you next time. At TBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make 
the gospel of grace go around the world. Without you, we couldn't do it. God bless you.